Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Eye on Icon. And as promised, I finally got around to getting Eric on the show. And with me today hosting is David as well. So David, how are you going? Good day, Fez. Doing very well. Very excited that I get to tag along on one of your famous interviews today. Um, oh, so I'll let, you, uh, I'll let you move forward and introduce our guest. Yes, Eric. Welcome to the show, man. I'm so happy to have you on. Uh, do you want to tell us who you are? Sure, yeah. I'm uh, Eric Solomon. I'm one of the technical leads at the Icon Foundation. And uh, I do a lot of stuff that I think we're going to talk about during this podcast. Yes, perfect. Perfect. Okay, so let, let's get to know a bit about you, Eric. I, I'm keen to know how you got into crypto and what experience you have in the past. Yeah, um, I'll do the like mildly entertaining version. Yes. Uh, awesome. So I got into crypto in um, 2016-ish, which was like, as I was graduating university, right now I'm 29. And so I was doing hackathons, which were pretty new at the time. Um, some of the people that I went to university with were actually the like initial organizers of the popular hackathons in the US, which yeah. was kind of cool to see that grow. But uh, there was this one person um, who I'm not gonna say their name, but I partnered with them on a lot of projects in these hackathons. And um, they were like really sort of well regarded, like winning competitions and whatever. And I just generally thought this person's very smart and then went to their uh, personal website one day. And they had this like very old school looking sort of just text website. And uh, in this section, it was just called ideas. They had a one liner that said like, um, Ethereum looks like it could be cool. Mm. And uh, then I just trusted this person's ideas so much that I went down the rabbit hole completely. I was like, oh, like this guy says it's cool. I'm going to dedicate a lot of time to this and um, kind of started that snowball rolling. And uh, to like conclude that arc, I checked back in on that person. Um, probably like 2019 or something like a few years later, we lost touch and that person was an international criminal oh and okay on the run from the u.s government and um so that was the person that introduced me to crypto was uh their story arc is probably much more interesting than mine um so then from there i uh was doing aerospace engineering and uh, got into something called distributed computing um, and the firms that I saw that were doing the most interesting stuff with distributed computing for general purpose things were like Gollum Network and uh, like IDEC, I believe, something like that. The ones that uh, were involved in cryptocurrency as well just started to like shoot out a bunch of applications and then eventually got onto this one early stage startup uh, where I like started doing technical development with them. And, you know, eventually I'm like writing smart contracts for them and, uh, then yeah kind of moved on from there further into it oh, cool i, I do Damn. remember Gollum. i uh i had a bag it was um, a cool idea yeah yeah we shared um graphics uh, processing and things like that um from from memory i think yeah it was... yeah they did uh this trying to make a general compute framework based mm. off of distributed computing resources so yeah. you'd like take a problem that's really hard and you split it to different computers to try to like process it together and yeah. amalgamate the results. Cool. No, no. Yep. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. Okay. Good. I, I didn't know that. Uh, I'm, I'm learning a lot today. So um, very, yeah. you, you come from that space and, and you, you've done a ton of stuff in the early days in crypto because Gollum and stuff were one of the few Ethereum and quite a lot of the early projects that, that had spun up. Um, so mm -hmm. you're well exposed to all of that at the time. So you've seen how uh, the crypto world has evolved as well. Yeah. Um, yeah, I can even remember like going to a lecture run by one of my friends that was like walking through the Bitcoin source code, which was probably like as Ethereum was just coming out. 
And um, over the time since then, which is five, six, seven years, something like that, I've also done a lot of reflecting about like, like there's so many sort of intermingling ideas as to, you know, what is the future? What is the purpose of this kind of part of industry? Like, what does it represent? And uh, even more like tangible things, like literally how do you explain this to somebody mm. um, is a, a huge point of reflection of mine. Like somebody hears that word and even still they're like, brain shuts off um so yeah the, it's it's been quite a like deep thought like a very long deep thought of um what's changing in the industry and what is important in my mind about it and how do i see other people interact with it yeah. cool so can i ask from um uh starting off well, I'm not starting off. You you spent uh, about ten years in open source before joining Icon, mm -hmm. and you've just given a bit of an insight into what what went down during those ten years in the in the fun version of the story. And I think there's an even more fun version of the story that I'd like to hear someday. The one where the names are uh, are outed. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah I'm so speculating. I'm speculating a lot. <laughs> Indeed. Um, now with Icon, it's a fun resolution too. Like. Man, I don't want to say too much, though. <laughs> <laughs> this is for the uh, Island Icon podcast night version. Ah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, anyway, it takes yeah, time. I, I was going to ask a, a straight up question now. Um, you're a tech lead at the Icon Foundation. What, what does that role mean for you? Yeah, so uh, this is obviously you guys have been in the ecosystem longer than I have. So I think our perspectives are going to cross a lot. Um, but I'll just tell you like the way that I have been thinking about it, which is like sort of even still evolving as I get to know more people in the community. Um, I joined January, what was it 2022, like right at the beginning of the year. Um, and I joined because of uh, my friend Cyrus Vorwald, who, um, I, when I was an aerospace engineer, I was working at this lab at the University of Maryland, and I was a graduate student, and Cyrus was an undergraduate student at the same lab. Mm -hmm. And um, we like were really solid partners working on that project together, and then became pretty good friends as well. And then, you know, he left to like go pursue his career, and I went to go pursue mine. And then we kind of got back in touch, and eventually he uh, was like, um, I just got this offer and I want to bring you on as well so we can be like partners on the Icon Foundation project as technical leads. So basically since the beginning of our like involvement, which he was October 2021 and I was January 2022, we've been like basically tag teaming a lot of things. Um, and the way that that works out is like... Uh, Cyrus focused on the development of the projects that are like ongoing and I focused on like the organization of the projects and like how they should be run basically. Um, so that's kind of the split. Cyrus is like keep the wheels turning like this product needs to come out make sure that it comes out make sure that it's following good development practices and I'm like what are the development practices how should we start to like you know, make this a better decentralized community and like what are the tenets of a good, you know, decentralized workflow from a technical perspective that should be incorporated into this project. Yeah. Um, and that's included initiatives like this Icon Builders program um, that's included working with organizations in the community to like give them advice, guidance um, on their technical projects and trying to help to connect them to other community members and uh yeah there's a few more things but that's yeah. the general idea yeah that that's that's clear and and one of the things one of the words i've been seeing popping around more and more is the word the, the grants right like mm -hmm. i've been seeing grants popping up left right and center we there were grant programs launched mm -hmm. um then we didn't hear much of them now they're kind of resurfacing and getting structured, it seems. So I'm assuming that's something that 
you're doing and with yeah. these yeah we, um the building in and around the icon ecosystem i think i can call it grant based because you kind of seem to issue grants for aspects of the building that you need um i'm unsure about how, how this exactly works but it seems to be common in in a broader crypto sense as well like there, there are there other big blockchains that work in the same way as icon does or as you think icon should do right um well i would change that perspective a little bit from being grants based to being more just like participation based um so building in a decentralized ecosystem is kind of like a well both interesting and like a tricky topic to tackle um because it, there's like something that i think has been present in some ways in icon is like the foundation becomes at the center of a lot of the activities in the community but really the idea should be that it should be like a more decentralized effort um and so that's kind of why i would change the perspective from like grant based to participation based because mm -hmm. uh you really want to see funding not just coming from like the foundation for like core things but from like a bunch of different resources that are all kind of working together towards like the same motivation, the same ethos. Um, so yeah, the way that that tends to work currently is there's like a core thing that the community needs to be done. And then uh, that either gets connected to a revenue stream which is like sort of a direct way for somebody to rationalize like pursuing it by themselves in a kind of a private way or there's some connection to like the overall ecosystem and how um like everybody benefits from it and typically that path um without the direct revenue stream attached to it is the one that like gets directed more towards the grants programs uh which the most popular ones are the like community grants programs and then the foundation direct grants programs. Mm -hmm. um, yep. So, yeah. In a, in a general sense, that's the way I think about it. Like participation should be sort of at the forefront, kind of a decentralized thing. And then these grant programs, they like um, should be sort of facilitated towards like encouraging that goal of uh, better participation. So, yeah. So just just on that, this is where I I get a bit confused because I, I I understand what you're saying. At the moment, a lot of Icon's efforts is driven through the foundation funding, mm -hmm. and and yes, we've yeah. had CPS. Uh, however, I would start to and people will object with my views, but I feel CPS has kind of just fallen in. We've got the same people, the validators, that role that is meant to be evolving, kind of going back to CPS, and we haven't got new builders coming in to do things. Um, mm -hmm. So my, my question and my confusion around this process is how do we incentivize people? Like, you know how you said your communities, how do you take the foundation out of it but make sure that people actually want to do this stuff? Because at the end of the day, people need a bit of money to, you know. So, to yeah, this is um, something that I'm, kind of in process working on with a couple of different team members from mm -hmm. the foundation as well. Because like you said, like the foundation is sort of at the center of a lot of the funding. Mm -hmm. And I think that there's like, you know, obviously we view the foundation as important and I think the community equally views it as important, but <clears throat> there is a notion that like, it's not a sustainable way to run a decentralized ecosystem is with like a single entity completely at the center of it. Um, you basically want to have like independent entities with independent like sources of incentivization that are um, all collaborating together in order to, you know, grow this thing. And you also don't want all of the like technical decisions to come directly from one central source as well. You want it to like kind of be this distributed thing that like all, you know, gets down to like a set of products that everybody uses together. Um, so and I on your point. I don't mean I, to cut you off, but I, I just wanted to, sorry, Eric, um, I, I wanted okay. to give context. And when you said that, it's like, 
Ethereum, for example, it's not one team driving the chain itself as it evolves. They actually, like I recall, they had um, several teams working on the proof of stake model and submitted solutions until eventually something was picked as the go ahead and they move forward with it. But that wasn't just the foundation and core devs working in the background. There were various teams and recently one of the teams got acquired by Layer 2, Arbitrum, etc. But but I think this is what you're trying to it'll, uh, evolve to, right? Where um, yeah. there, there's a lot of different driving forces helping in the evolution of the Icon network. And yeah, so to um, connect that to the like incentivization and like profitability mm. or sustainability revenue generating model, um, you don't also in the Ethereum ecosystem, just to use that example, only see the Ethereum Foundation providing funding for things. Although yeah. they like do provide a lot of funding for things, you've got like you know, 90, I don't know if 90%, but like half of the venture capital firms at least or whatever that are involved in cryptocurrency are like invested at least partially in the Ethereum ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And what that gets is like a number of different like motivations, perspectives um, that are all like creating, you know, the future developments of become what becomes the por the core products. And uh, additionally to just like foundations and venture capital firms, you've also got like a pretty clear influence from uh, like businesses that collaborate with, you know, more traditional partners that are like, um, I don't know, like Starbucks collaborated mm -hmm. with Polygon. Polygon's a huge contributor to mm -hmm. the Ethereum ecosystem, just as an example um, for any anything like the Ethereum client, the EVM itself, whatever. Um, they partnered with Starbucks and they partnered with like Instagram and whatever hmm. to do stuff with NFTs. And so now you've got like these um, more traditional, how do you say, like incentivization uh, schemes for a company to pursue development of some shared core product that such that it like addresses their roadmap and their issues and mm -hmm. like you know their ethics and perspective on what should be the future um so yeah that's probably the three things i can pick off off the top of my head is like an independent revenue stream a revenue stream that's funded by a, a non-profit um you know entity such as a foundation but there can be multiple i'm sure there are multiple foundations involved in ethereum for instance and a more like for-profit entity that funds projects to be developed for a specific ethos, which is, you know, the comparison is something like a venture capital firm or uh, a DAO kind of like sits in the middle of all of this. But yeah, like that's part of it too. Mm. Okay. Yep. So that's the goal. Yeah. Yeah. So, and I know like even because, uh, yeah, we have CPS and really our CPS is, it's got a ton of untapped potential, right? Like, uh, like when, when you think of it, there's so many evolutions that can happen from it or variations, like even Gitcoin, for example, um, that that's a big, I, I recall in the early days that drove a lot of growth on Ethereum from a content from all angles, not just from a development perspective, um, because it, it, utilize community donations on top of you know matching and and the way the quadriatric funding and stuff works so <laughs> um but, but yeah so uh, in icon we have so so much uh, space to innovate on the current model uh, on the current models that we have and uh, look let, let's lead into the next part because you have been doing a ton of work there and one of the examples is the builders program so um i, I would like to could you talk through what the builders program is uh, and why you what is the goal why you why you focus and zoned in on that to build that out yeah um i want to just give like a little bit of clarity on my perspective just like as a a human like as a worker as well mm. because i think it's useful to see like why am i structuring things in this way um i heard this quote the other day it was something like take the broad view and uh the kind of idea is like if you've got an idea for a very specific domain there's also applications of what you can learn to like you know different aspects of your life as well 
So uh, I'm kind of approaching the builders program as this thing that like it doesn't um, all it does is like facilitate like connections basically um, the way you can kind of see that happening is um, the like three sort of main components I laid out for it is um, the like ecosystem, which is like basically where the domain is currently for this uh, ecosystem. It's, you know, there's like some ancillary things going on in the like Polkadot ecosystem. There's the icon main network. And then there's also the like, interoperability technology which is like all within the ecosystem kind of within like slightly overlapping but you know independent spheres and then you've got this like roles based system which is like detailing if you wanted to participate then like how can you participate and you know what role do you lead yourself towards and what do you adopt are you a technical person are you a business developer are you creating content are you just using products stuff like that um, and then obviously the one that like most people tend to focus on as the role of the foundation is um, the grants programs and uh, like how do you then lead people towards some like bootstrapping funding mm -hmm. or if they are a, kind of a more pro bono or like nonprofit y project and then how do you like give them a sustainable way to fund themselves and uh, so the builder program contains like this diverse information because it's all connected it's it's you know take the broad view it's like a user doesn't exist if a technical member doesn't create a product a technical member like either needs to become the business developer themselves or they need to partner with somebody else who can get like a team together for them and the like I think one of the major points that has been lacking from the icon ecosystem um, historically is the like way that all that stuff is related to each other. Um, there's, you know, if I were to just take like a random stab at it, something like 20, 30 businesses or whatever that are running that are like dependent on the icon ecosystem in some way. And, you know, like a couple, like maybe a thousand or whatever people that like regularly interact with the icon ecosystem. And um, they all have interest in each other, but they don't all have a means of like constructively interacting with each other. Um, as like a kind of a simple example of what the builder program, like one thing that I've been working on with it is... Um, people will come into the discord server sometimes and they'll go to this channel that's been set up called like dev intro for like introing yourself as mm -hmm. a technical member of the community. And then they'll post something about themselves. Like I have skills in JavaScript for five years. I've worked with the been funded by the like interchain foundation on some project. And I've worked with, you know, teams that are distributed across the globe. So I'm seeking a project within the icon ecosystem can you help me connect to that? Um, and that, like that channel even didn't really exist previously, but now that it does exist, you can kind of see like one of the missing things that needs to be more built up from the ecosystem is like these people are interested to come work and do constructive like technical developments, but they don't even know where to go only recently has there started to be more of a dialogue in that channel which is like people picking up on like if i want to start a business or run a project i can go find the people that have expressed interest here and like pick them up for a team and the future development of that is um there's three or four depending on how my meetings go jobs boards that i'm partnering with um to like get better ecosystem integrations so that like not only can people advertise themselves in some like kind of more ephemeral scrolling discord channel but they can also like use these services that help them connect to like businesses that are already established to be offering mm -hmm. or from the other perspective as a business you can like help connect to people that want to you know develop and work for 
some established rate that like they can project their skill sets on. Um, those are yeah, Eden Protocol is one of them, uh, Crypto.Jobs, uh, Hive, and uh, Trebutor are those four. Uh, Eden Protocol, we're getting, I don't know, I talk about this a lot, it's from Developer DAO, and we're getting a demo of how they can integrate it into the Discord server, uh, hopefully early December. So like people can, instead of just putting their notice on, they can like send some message to a bot and then be integrated into a job matching system. Um, oh, okay. Is I think really awesome idea. And, yeah. uh, you know, we're discussing with the Hive Foundation or the Hive Project to like make a better ecosystem connection so that people can get paid on their service in mm -hmm. Icon and then we can help direct like technical members to, um, Put their profile up on hive and uh businesses to like put their you know jobs or bounties if they want to do one-off stuff on hive as well um as a way to like kind of create more actionable items for the roles that are being established in the builders program as it sort of relates to the ecosystem and um I think, you know, there's the third part, obviously, which is the grants program, which is important. And some of that stuff will probably be like, if you've got a job or something like that, you can connect it to these jobs platforms. Um, but also, like, from that perspective of what we were talking about earlier of different incentivization streams, it should ideally be then connected further to, like, a venture capital firm who wants to provide ecosystem support or an independent firm that, like, has their own, you know, revenue stream from whatever product or partnership that they're producing that they can uh, like provide ecosystem support and um, so a little less focus specifically on just grants as like a sustainability measure. Um, yeah, that's kind of the builders program and then an example about it in like, um, but yeah, take the broad view is kind of the, the perspective I'm taking on it. Okay. And, and then some of the stuff you've just touched on as well, it seems like your goal is, uh, uh, and you've touched on this a few times, is enabling teams to get get resources, um, and at the same time, whatever they're building, giving them exposure to other funding methods. So that mm -hmm. is not foundation related necessarily. So in this case, what you were just talking about, that's how I've understood it. Um, is that a, a yeah. good takeaway? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Some of that stuff obviously needs to be further developed as yeah. like a business development, you know, endeavor. Like, how do we then get more people invested in the ecosystem? But mm. yeah, hundred mm. percent. And okay. uh, can I ask a question about the uh, so-called crypto job boards um, that are mm. out there? Have yeah. have these always been around, or is this something that's kind of popped up since I don't know last bull market, or is it something that is just recently grown? Yeah. Is there a steady flow of is it only devs coming through or is it all sorts of uh, crypto enthusiasts that are seeking jobs in it? Uh, it's like not old, I guess, but yeah, it's probably been, if I were to guess, the first ones were popping up in and around like the 2017-ish bull market. Yeah. Just because that was when so much money was like getting thrown into the industry. Before that, I don't think you saw as many dedicated sources, but now there's like, two major developments obviously that have happened since then one is there's more money in established projects and two there's like sort of more interesting ways to get paid based off of smart contract and like asset flow yeah um so companies are trying to like create more market niches based off of these new things that haven't really been capitalized on is a sign of ancillary effect but it, yeah it's across the board it's not it's not only crypto jobs as well although it is mostly crypto jobs and it's not just tech jobs. There's a lot of like design work and you know copywriting and stuff. And and if I were to simplify it, like explain it to me, like I'm five, could I say that you're plugging in the Icon Builder program into these external job boards to get more eyes on it from people that are not in the Icon Discord, for example? Kind of like I would say it's sort of the opposite way. Like I'm plugging these things into the Builder program. But yeah, I don't know. Either yeah. way, where it's like. You're plugging them together. <laughs> <That's it. laughs> so, and on that, like, 
So me and David have in the weekly news been drawing a lot of attention to the builders program and the site that's being built and um, oh, David's going to kill me. What are they called? RFPs? Did I get it right? I got it right. Yeah. Nailed it. 10 out of 10. Okay. End of show. Thanks, guys. Um, <laughs> so uh, one one of the pieces, so those um, RFPs are great because it's highlighting a hole, a need that we have for uh, uh, things to get done. But one of the things that throws me off is, and I've, I've experienced this firsthand because people have looked at it and gone, oh, but what is the expectation in terms of, of my time to deliver this in terms of cost? Uh, so how, how do we tackle that? Because, um, yeah, I, I honestly see that as a major uh, blocker because, uh, for example, those RFPs at the moment, Eric, a uh, majority of them that are on there, are they looking to take that work and go to CPS for funding or do they go um, to the foundation for a grant? Uh, right. So there's like two or three developments with the RFPs that are happening. And just as a baseline, RFP means request for proposal. Oh, thank God. You so it that. is good. Yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah. It's inherently connected to a funding source. You're requesting that somebody proposes to like bid essentially on a project yeah. so like it's always got like a this is the expected budget or cost or whatever associated with it okay okay because the forms currently didn't have that so i was confused so okay. i did a lot of this stuff by myself yeah, and yeah. now they're starting to get like more understanding and support for it yeah and that was kind of my hope honestly is like i could just be like hey this is the thing and then other people would jump in and be like oh we can use this and yes. so how do we flush it out um, but the things that are developing there, one is obviously fleshing out like the templates for what is an RFP and um, like how much effort is associated, what's the team size that should be associated with it, how do you deliver on a product. Some of that is connected to some of the other resources I've been kind of establishing with some folks as well, like the grants program public resources. Um, but the other development is... Uh, the like discretization of the rfp list the request for proposal list based off of like the domains or i guess there's one more after this too and what i mean by discretization is like the cps is kind of in process or in discussion currently to be to have its own rfp list mm. so that it would be specific for that source and then there would be one for the icon foundation grants and then there would be another for this kind of currently being restructured interoperability incentive fund. And I think the ICE program has a developer grants, which they're working on an RFP list, which we're going to help them advertise as well. And um, then the third thing is um, this is currently in the works and needs to be developed a bit further, but it's in collaboration with the icon DAO team. Uh, and, um, this is, uh, breaking news, I guess. I don't know. Alpha. Go on. Yeah, drop, drop, this, drop. Right here. <laughs> Let's go. But, uh, so they've got this really cool internship program and the interns want to know what to do. And they were looking at the RFP list and they kind of talked to me about it. They're like, Hey, like, is this list even up to date or whatever? Like, should we be using this list? And so me and them, have, and Elise have been working together to like think of a plan for how do we make that list more useful. And one of the things that we're looking to do is get more feedback from organizations in the community. Like, you know, for instance, the Balanced team or the HANA Wallet team or like even the Ion Icon team or whatever of like things that they would like to see for the ecosystem as like kind of an effort to even further decentralize interests. Like, what do you want to see from the ecosystem? How can we turn that into an RFP um, that like either one would be like, you know, something that could be proposed to the foundation mm -hmm. to get funding for, or two could also get support from one of those organizations that like, you know, they want to like target either hiring somebody and trying out an intern to like pursue this thing to see if they're worth hiring or not or like just using it as like a bounty style um like target 
for a development that they want done without committing to a full-time resource um, where they can like contribute something that they want done and then fund part of it or all of it if they felt like it was worthwhile enough um, to get implemented on either like a core product from the icon foundation or sorry from the icon ecosystem or from like one of their specific products that they're working on um so yeah a couple of new things to kind of clarify how the rfp flow should work so it, yeah because sorry Fez, uh where, where does accountability lie when um uh, third parties say hey could you write an rfp for this Mm -hmm. so that we can build it and then the rfp shows up they propose what but you know who's the 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 owner of this like who's the end res in the end responsible because if the initial party who like we're getting um prfps pr proposed our uh, requests for proposals yeah it should be i mean that's a good way to handle it and, so, and then uh, yeah just wondering like how does that work from a foundation perspective because they would uh oblige and say okay it seems like this is wanted so we're gonna see if we can make this happen but when after providing a grant does the foundation what what is the role from the foundation once the grant is provided um to clarify can you clarify what you mean by accountability yeah so what would happen if the party who gets the provided grant delivers uh, only three quarters of the product and mm -hmm. then um just kind of you know starts slacking or uh, so that would out. be um in the structure of the contract that gets made and i think that there's probably two ways to handle that um the first way if you take a look at the icon dash project slash community i'm glad that i just spelled out a url live but um, there's a repository on GitHub, public thing, that describes uh, like development guidelines. So that's going to be part of it. Like you need to use these development guidelines in order to like, you know, be eligible to receive the full funding essentially. Um, and then additionally, the grants program. There's like a public set of resources in a different repository through the Icon Project organization on GitHub also that described the steps that needs to be taken in terms of like updating the, uh, the foundation or, you know, it also goes similarly. There's a similar thing for the CPS on the progress that you're making yeah. um, and like whether you're sticking to your timelines or not. And uh, based off of like looking at that information in kind of a broken down templated way, like it's easier to track who's following and who's not. So if, they've done a poor job and we're still passing the money through then the accountability is going to lie on the foundation if for instance the funding comes from the foundation so yeah. if it doesn't turn out the way you expect and the foundation's the only person involved foundation gets blamed feel free to raise a ruckus that's fine with me um the other side of it is that if these rfps are coming from somebody within the community then my vision like what i would try to establish basically is sort of like a partnership on the um the evaluation of the progress of the project so that would be like um let's say the hana wallet team was proposing an rfp that had to do with a universal login mechanism or whatever mm -hmm. And then the foundation put it on the foundation RFP list and decided like, this is good enough to be something that's funded by the foundation. However, it has applicability to the HANA wallet project. And, you know, obviously you'd want it to be a little more general than that. But um, what we would, I would want for us to do is partner with somebody like a liaison from the HANA wallet team to like contribute to both looking over the progress reports as well as doing like regular, you know, you probably want monthly um, check-ins with the development like entity, the team or individual or whatever um, to make sure that the product is getting developed as expected and not only following the guidelines that are like pretty explicitly laid out, but also following the product like um more like 
realization of the product specifications that um, the team that is partnering on that RFP would like for it to become. Yeah, that 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 makes sense. And then the the guidelines would make it uh, uh, hard to have gray areas, I suppose. And it would basically be more a yes or a no. That yeah. So and anyone yeah. could be a liaison in that sense. It also um, I don't want to focus totally on like accountability and like punishment kind of um i also because i think a lot about this idea of like when is something like an easy rule to follow or when is something like a suggested rule to follow that you can like either follow it or just not follow it and um what the guidelines provide is like an easy way to pursue a successful path that like it's really meant to help you you know it's not meant to be like a rule that like we're going to slap you on the wrist if you don't follow it although in some cases that is what's going to happen it's meant to be more like this is what has proven to be successful and everybody has kind of like contributed toward this knowledge base or you know experts in the area at least have contributed towards this knowledge base to let you know like how you can do something um so yeah the, the accountability thing is definitely there but then there's another side to it too which is like the resources provided should also be um like a, a, almost like a book that you can read or like a guideline right? yeah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so so i think it's good to give a bit of perspective here and I'm going to say it from the way I've taken it. Um, okay. In the past, it seems like we would give grants and there was a process. I don't know what that process was, but there was no structured, visible process for someone to go and see that these are the guidelines you need to adhere to. This is what happens here. This is how and traceability for, from that uh, for that aspect. Um, a lot of what you're bringing to the table and I've seen Cyrus has done with uh, the icon bridge project in terms of is is open up open source and um, uh, what is it the transparency transparent can, yeah exactly you can literally go into github and see everything that's happening including progress reports for the teams that are actually working on the project uh, you you are handling with the RFPs and stuff this is something I've always said it's like I get the foundation needs to step back, but the initial direction of where our holes are would need to be driven from the foundation initially, right? So this is where mm -hmm. we need we need more dev tools. We need more, uh, in, instead of going to the community, guys, we need more of this. Nothing has happened. That's what's happened in the past. And no one's come to the table bringing a solid plan to enable the ecosystem. And a great yeah. example is, Eric, you, you've come into the role, you've seen these massive gaps and you're trying to put these processes. Without them, we'd still be 12 months ago, everyone kind of going, hey, well, when are, when are people going to do something and give us a bit of direction here? So um, fundamentally, that is being addressed and has been addressed for the last year with all the work you've been doing there. So um, now it's about uh, getting people to see the model that you've built that is still evolving and going, oh yeah, how about we need, we need, I've noticed this gap, this gap there, what are your thoughts and start building out that list of um, RFPs of things that we potentially need to get funded and worked on to make our ecosystem more vibrant. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I've kind of gone on a bit of a rant, but this is, this is kind uh, of. That's good. Yeah, that's, that's all very true. You're, you're hitting a lot of good points there. Yeah. Okay, cool. So. Uh, well, one note also, which is, um, this went under the radar, I think, but the list of RFPs that is there currently is mostly from the community. And it's also a decently good list, at least. Uh, probably like eight months or so ago, I posted a, something on the forum.icon community. Yeah. I was like, hey, like, can you guys tell me what you think is necessary? And I got probably like 10 to 15 ideas from that list. And uh, most of them made it onto the list of like what is essentially um developer resources currently uh and That's a few awesome. of them have been funded already including the one which i really like which is the drogon project which um this is like a developer bootstrapping oh yes and, yes um fomo uh, um 
uh, yeah. Fomamental is. So, so th- th- that's where I, I guess uh, I have questions around it as well, because th- this is why I came back to the um, what is the expected price range, because I started to notice a trend a little while back in Icon is at times we had these community members like FOMO who have contacts in the industry, it would appear, and they arrange teams to do certain, like the hard hat tooling, etc. cetera. Um, however, it goes to CPS. And I mean, when you're getting these kind of teams, they're not all gonna be cheap. Stuff's gonna cost money to get done. But I started yep. to notice where well, as soon as it's a bit expensive, everyone just, well, the validators just vote no too much, or, you know, and, and it started to become quite disheartening because finally, when we're getting the talent we want, uh, we're well, not getting good people. prove the value add basically. And so this is part of, part of what you were saying before about the foundation, like stepping back, but still needing to do stuff. Mm. Um, I've been having like meetings every single month with the Drogon team and going through like exactly what like the status of that project is and exactly where i would expect it to be based off of like you know where it is currently Mm -hmm. and where like sort of the guidelines and structure i've been laying out is and um they've been doing a really awesome job but like the very first meeting you know when they presented their like progress report it was for instance like using a different template from the one that i mentioned and um you know now it's all using the right templates it's got all the right markers it's like using the right style of releases and they've got their Mm. like good scheduling up so um ideally like that's not necessarily going to be my responsibility for every project that goes through the cps but the general idea is like in order to um justify funding projects like drogon that have like you know are more costly um but are also very useful Mm. Uh, you need to show success essentially. So like that's one of my roles currently essentially is um, to make sure that this specific project, the Drogon project, which I think is like one of the most useful things that can be added to the ecosystem and has already kind of been agreed upon by the ecosystem to fund it, you know, to get a working product out there, it becomes successful. Um, so I'm like connecting them to different groups in the ecosystem so that they can use it at their, like, you know, when they onboard new members or when they want to start a project or like, how can they use it in their own products and, um, helping them like, uh, with their roadmap and making sure that like what they end up producing and documenting is like something that, you know, follows what would be like best industry practices. Um, and between those two points, what essentially I would hope you should see at the end is something that's been created that's from like day zero useful mm. and is from day zero integrated with the community. So like it's not just going to get thrown by the wayside. It's going to become a tool that like people appreciate and kind of I would hope at least somewhat depend on um for things related to compilation and testing and deployment. And um, then the project like hits that cycle of sustainability, mm. which is really the big thing. So you see that success model, and then you see like, these are the steps that the, you know, foundation in essentially helped to take to establish that process um, for this project if I want to have a successful project, that's the steps that I can take. Yeah. Um, and there's some stuff that I'm doing currently for the CPS to like help more people become involved in like what is currently going on so that like there's more visibility on the steps that are being taken for like one, if something is successful, you know, then like they know how to do it. But then if it's not successful, how can we like reflect on it, like do take notes, provide like a case study on what went wrong and figure out how to improve on it so that the next time it is successful. Mm. Um, And this one is looking good so far. So I have decent hopes for it. But yeah, it's it's, there's a process ongoing to open that up as well. Because because I guess when you look at CPS, a lot's being funded. And if you even go through the progress report, everyone does it completely different. 
Um, and this, this is a project that was asking for a lot of funding, critical um, infrastructure. When it's done, it, it has a lot of adds a lot of value. Um, so y'all have gotten involved. I guess this, I've seen in this particular instance, the foundation has been a bit more involved in a CPS funded project. But as you've called out, the reason for that is to kind of ensure its success and create these steps needed so that it can be implemented for future CPS proposals so that there's more um, visibility on ownership and delivery uh, finally when funding is being given. That's how I've seen, because I have observed this particular project as well. It's funny you brought it up, Eric. I have observed it and had a few conversations around it as well. Um, so it's good to hear your perspective and why um, you're, you're also, I would say, very passionate about its success because you're, you're yeah. modeling um, a lot of it at the end of it. Yeah. You're going to use it. It's also just a good tool. Like, <laughs> I mean, yes, apart from <laughs> that. <laughs> for sure. I wouldn't have been involved with it if I didn't like the idea. Yeah. So, in, in a, a one, one, while, while we're on this topic, because I find this interesting, because I've seen, and the tracker is a, is a great one. I, I don't know the ins and outs, but I, I noticed the tracker was done in phases. Um, and I'll pause that there, but it seems like this tool as well is being done in phases in terms of um, application processes. So what what is the, you know, we get 80% and then all of a sudden in the final 20% CPS gets voted no. Like, you know, that is a high risk uh well, yeah, I mean, it's, it's about connection. It's all like, it's all about connecting to people because like nothing essentially is useful in a vacuum. Like hmm. the only reason why some tools useful is it because it like helps some other company generate a sh revenue stream or it like helps your company do that or something like that. Um, so in terms of like, whether things should be done in phases or whether they should be done all the way at one shot. Um, basically, what you want to do is schedule your development around. I mean, this is one example, like uh, you don't necessarily want to use the term minimum viable product, but it's like a relatively useful reference. Mm -hmm. um, what you want is to be able to show progress all the time. Um, and <clears throat> you want to have people that you're accountable to as well um so like a project that just gets done by itself again it's useful to nobody unless it like sort of very mysteriously and organically comes picked up but you ideally want like some person or group of people that are invested in a specific thing which is kind of the idea of the cps it's like you're taking a poll of like what these people are interested in and like you know um pursuing those ideas and then, like, ideally, you would want to have some, like, guideline for, for projects of all sizes. How can they show that they're either on the path to that original idea or that they can, like, make a course correction um, if they need to, if the, like, reasons for pursuing that thing have changed in some way, or that they can, like, reach some point of finality that like ideally impacts the like sur survivability, the sustainability of their group, the least amount. Mm. Um, so like in the first outcome, you produce the exact thing. If it's a short-term project, you do it in one shot. If it's a long-term project, you need to schedule like a demo. You yeah, need to yeah. schedule like an initial use case. That's way simpler than the overall use case, something like that. In the second one, you still need to have those demos and like, you know, showcases of a product and ability for somebody to actually use a product in some way, um, like a, a legitimate product, not just the marketing resources mm -hmm. surrounding the product. Um, but like, you also need to be adaptable, you know, you need to like, make it so that when the project idea adjusts, you're not like, throwing away every single thing that you've done, unless that's absolutely necessary. And then the third finality, which just kind of like brainstorming here, obviously there's more, but um, where the idea gets scrapped, you know? And what you don't want is to like be malignant in that scenario. You don't want to be like, like screw your team, you know? Like I know you worked on this thing for six months and you were kind of betting on it for some yeah. reason. Like 
that you could put it in your portfolio or that you could eventually use it to generate revenue. But like, we no longer care about it. Yeah. Get yeah. out. Like <laughs> you want to help them reach that final point. Yes. If it does become something that's not useful and then say like, you know, we can still connect you to these other projects that mm -hmm. are useful or something like that. Or like, uh, we can connect you to these jobs boards for the things that we are looking for. And yeah. so, yeah, you want to make sure that, um, we don't lose that, the talent, right. As well, that, that, that's the, end yeah, yeah, that's important too. Cause this is something that has happened, uh, unfortunately, in icon, yeah, like uh, as time has gone, it's become irrelevant. And then we've just lost the team in general, which is, it was a real shame. Um, so without probing, I'm glad to hear you actually say that. So that that's fantastic. Um, I, I know, uh, Eric, I had all these questions around the community update, but our conversation's been great and we've been really, you know, deep diving into certain sections. I I, I wanted to ask about the SIGSO um, special interest groups because yeah. Cyrus has mentioned it. We've done a few tech updates. We've seen that um, come out. Your community updates really um, zone in on this. And, and I have... Um, I'm curious to know a few things about it, but in general, uh, can you just give a quick overview about SIGs and the goals? Yeah, I'll do a quick version so you can ask more questions. Yeah. Uh, there's also two other types. There's special interest groups, there's working groups, and there's user groups. Yeah. Basically, the idea is special interest group is like a team that's working on a product mm -hmm. that's pretty core, and they or like a domain that's pretty core and they focus on a specific domain. Um, so interoperability SIG is like a big SIG. There's another SIG that's called contributor experience, which is managing the technical community updates, for instance. Mm -hmm. And then there's another SIG that's called documentation, which you know is managing the documentation. Yeah. Um, and then there's working groups, which is like if there's a project that's a collaboration between SIGs, that's a working group. It's a temporary thing. Yep, yep. Then there's also user groups, which is not a core product, but is something that's like core to the ecosystem that doesn't involve like basically core collaboration from the foundation. So the, the user group that I just established is user group sustainability, which, um, as you guys know, the CPS, it like is involved with the community, but it's not specific to the foundation. It's like run by everybody in the community. The um, idea is that the CPS can like kind of be led by this user group, which like involves interaction from contracting groups as well as the foundation and the delegators or the delegates can participate in it as well. And um, this user group sustainability is also um, like one of the ones that I think would make sense to kind of lay out a guideline for like how to submit projects on the CPS or like, you know, how to establish your business in the ecosystem and stuff like that. So okay. how, how do these groups come together? Like, and, and, and is it all, uh, is it, are these groups funded? Are these voluntarily formed out of, thin air uh so these groups have been bootstrapped basically by mostly me and cyrus so far um and uh they are you know formed based off of this existing uh model for like a community organizational structure from this project called uh kubernetes which comes from the cloud native computing foundation and they're like wildly successful and they have a cool model of sigs ugs and wgs and um so the way that we've established the first ones is like just talking amongst ourselves. Like, is there anything that you can abstract out into a domain that you already currently have control over? So Cyrus is like, yes, like interoperability, obviously not the full scope of it, but I'm doing the icon bridge and now integrations for the BTP stuff as well. Mm -hmm. um, that's like a thing that's ongoing is uh, within the domain of resources that Cyrus is already facilitating, working on and connections to. So like, there's no real voluntary aspect of it. It's just stuff that was already happening mm -hmm. that is now like in a more public setting with this like more holistic set of guidelines and like, you know, associated meetings and stuff. Yeah. Um, 
And similarly, contributor experience, that was me. Documentation, that was me. The sustainability is like TJ's part of that. Uh, that's me as well. And then, you know, I'm going to basically help with some of the developments of the CPS through that. But it doesn't really change anything. It's just like more public and people can come to participate. Right. So, and this is interesting because this is what, I was getting mentally blocked with because I just couldn't understand who's coming to the party um, to give this kind of structure and work and put in that effort and not get yeah. any anything out of it in terms of like, it, what, what I mean by that is like, there's only so much volunteering you can do, right? Uh, and mm -hmm. a lot of what I'd been reading, it, I always just got this uh, impression idea from it that people would have to volunteer and, and come in and do side hustles etc but one component that hadn't clicked and now it has is some most many of these SIGs and these user groups is leveraging on existing contracts with teams like ibris and things like that who actually are building core infrastructure pieces across all the icon ecosystem and getting yeah. them involved and going hey these are all our target points you're working on them. Well, if you're part of this and you wanted to expand it, what would you need? What would you like to see? What would you? So yeah. is that that's kind of been the penny dropping right now moment, light bulb moment for me. Okay. Yeah. Um, by the way, I think Ibris is Venture 23 now. I'm not totally sure. I'm, but yeah, I anyway, hear the name change it. Yeah, that's the like, thing you just mentioned of uh, like, what do you get out of it? How do, you know, how do we help you facilitate? That's sort of the whole point of these groups is like, there is actually a lot of benefit to participating in them mm. because you get to like target whatever thing you want to happen for the ecosystem with like almost no barrier to entry for participation. If you want to see like a guide developed on like how to connect your company to an existing revenue stream from something like balance, for instance, there's a user group that like, you know, I'm still working on it, but the mm. idea is the balanced group, like, can similarly use that group to connect themselves with another company's revenue stream. Yeah. If you like wanted to learn how to integrate BTP into your product, you could collaborate with the interoperability team to like produce a guide for it or something like mm. that. And then it makes your workflow a lot easier. You get to offload some of your labor to like these other people that are contributing, you know, it's like a free, free asking and whatever. And yeah people rationalize contributing stuff as well based off of like they're getting stuff for free. So, so <laughs> at the moment, Eric, I know you said you've reached out, but people listening to podcasts and, and I'm, I'm going to target the validators because a lot of our validators still operate on the P rep and they have their teams and they're doing things. H how could they, if they're listening to this podcast and go, Oh, I didn't realize all this stuff's happening. We have a lot of information and a lot of value add, or we want to be part of this how where should they go what should they do yeah so um there's a uh, the first place i'm trying to think of how you can get there from like non github resources mm -hmm. but um essentially what you would do is like make your way to the icon project github and then there's a repository called community and from there you can look through the special interest groups and user groups um not all of them have contact information, but some of them do have contact information on them, like the user group sustainability, which I think is related to like CPS and, you know, the validators might have interest in that one um, for leading development on it, for introducing better project workflows and whatever. Mm. It links to like a Discord channel, I think, yeah. um, where you can go. Cool. Should, should all validators be in special interest groups? Uh, if you want, I mean, there's value in it, so I would do it, but I would also like figure out what exactly do I want to find value in both in terms of like, what do I want to get? And then what can I contribute? And um, that's the like equivalency there. If you're really good with technical stuff, you might want to like contribute to some core development special interest group and help to bootstrap that. If you were like very savvy with business practices and business development efforts and partnering with people and stuff, you know, maybe go to the user group for sustainability and then just be like, hey, so I can get something out of these meetings or give something to it. So so in, in this scenario, scenarios that you've just explained, 
would they go in and and offer you know this, you don't this, have to offer anything okay so uh, just like i want this and then you'll figure out how to rationalize for yourself what you want to offer but and and so I, I guess what i'm leading to is when they go it's their time and energy and part of that process is it that they get um, you know, an RFP gets put together based on a need or, or there's something and then they can get funding via CPS, et cetera, to yeah. enable I have them. it in the, um, so for instance, let's just take user group sustainability. Yeah. That group um, contains two informational things you can read. One of them is a charter file, which is like establishes basically the activities of this group. Um, and that list that I put together is like at least a first draft, which I thought was pretty good of establishing like, what are the things you can get? Mm. So one of the things I'm proposing is like, you can get a case study on your business practices for the previous quarter, for instance, or previous year. Um, so if you wanted something like that, you know, you can get other people in the in, uh, ecosystem to review what you've done and then tell you how you should improve or like, you know, if you wanted to use it to connect to another business to try to like value prop them for like, how can I contribute to your thing in order to get a piece of the revenue that you bring in, mm. then um, you could like meet with them through one of the communication channels that's listed or like come to a meeting that you think they might be at and then just be like, hey, can I like grab you for a second to discuss this thing? Mm. Um, or yeah, just post it as a discussion thread on GitHub or whatever. Okay. Uh, but come, I guess, either to explore or like of an idea of something you want. I'm making what I think are useful ideas. Mm -hmm. The idea, using that word a lot, is um, that you should have something that you want and you should yeah. like either do it or ask people for it so that like we can all come together to figure out like how do we then you know work together so that we're both getting what we want we're all getting what we want and like my business is more successful your business is more successful you get to like grow as a developer or as a content creator or as a person or whatever cool i mean i i could keep asking and digging and and but um, um we're over an hour so uh, i want to I, I think we should uh round it off david did you have anything else you wanted to get off your chest uh at the moment no this has been a lot of very um interesting and insightful information i think for both of us fez uh mm -hmm. on on how things you know are 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 being designed and and how stuff that we've already seen happening left and right now like it's, it's clicking like like you said earlier as well um would, would this view like basically what's in your head eric would that show up somewhere for example on the is this all on the icon.foundation build uh, website or is that something in progress like will it be will, will people have to listen to this uh, podcast episode oh no this shows up yeah i mean for one thing in the community thing for another thing in the grants program resources the builder program site contains a lot of this information as well and then there's something that i'm working on with a couple of folks for like kind of community management um called the orbit model which is like a model for typically developer relations but i'm sort of co-opting it to more general community management that's come pretty highly recommended by um, the Polygon Dev Relations team and then a couple other teams, the Superfluid team and I think Avalanche as well. Mm -hmm. um, I've, yeah, they were like very for it. Like you should basically, you know, prioritize different types of participation and see like how people like to interact and help them figure out how they can be incentivized and provide them with incentives and stuff like including access to funding sources or access to like debugging sessions with developers if you wanted. Um, mm. But that is another thing that I'm like in the process of publicizing and kind of structuring like exactly how to best portray it to people for, you know, better collaboration and um, like usage. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, yeah, I have the last question actually on my list here was um, for Eric. Uh, had or have you <clears throat> already uh, subscribed to the Ion Icon uh, YouTube channel? If yes, 
why and if no uh, why not uh no and i will do that after this <laughs> why not is um i basically was waiting to get the interview first <laughs> <laughs> nice nice um no look up i was it's a great question and i was literally gonna say myself Every time you you've got some making progress and you're hitting some milestones, Eric, you should jump on the show um, yeah, yeah. And, and share it because like th- this is the stuff I, I genuinely like. Here in the RFPs, I know you've been working in the background, but David bought this. I actually saw a random link, um, and then David, when I asked him about it, he smacked me on the head virtually, going, "You should know this. This is not a question you should be asking me." And I was like, "Ah, um, so." Like seeing stuff like this is exciting and, and it shows that stuff is happening. And I, and you know what? It's me just not being oblivious to it because I know you have actively dropping blogs, giving, um because I went through some of the past community technical updates that you have put out where you have been talking about this stuff. So it's not like this is the first time you're coming on the show and, and, and this is the first news about it. You have been proactively saying what you've been up to. Uh, I don't know. I've been in a hole somewhere. But um, <laughs> so look, really excited to get you back on every time you feel like there are major milestones you're crossing that the community should be knowing about, the dev community, all our communities across Icon that should know and come in and celebrate or join the action themselves. Um, I know me and David constantly now in our weekly news talk about people signing up to GitHub and playing jokes that we've recently signed up and it's a whole new world out there because it, it, GitHub is is for a specific user yeah, group. Yeah, it's yeah. esoteric. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, cool. Okay, no, look, Eric, thank you so much for coming on the show, man. Really appreciate it. Hell yeah, this was great. I look forward to the next time. Thank awesome, you. awesome. As always, everyone, not financial advice. Oh, we're meant to tell you to make sure you like and subscribe during the interview. So right at the end, we say that. Um, eh, David, thanks for being on. It's It's been good having you on and, you know, together interviewing. Usually it's me solo and it's more relaxing when, when there's someone else to take a bit of the pressure off. It's been very, it's been a lot of fun to do, actually. I see why you like doing these. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> Cool. Take care. Thanks, Eric. All right. Cheers, y'all. Bye.